Okay. <clears throat> now, we were in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 on page 12 of the manual. And some of these, as we go through, you'll notice, as, a little bit further on, you'll start seeing lines drawn underneath that you can actually make your notes in. And I would encourage you to make notes, look through this, work through this. We're going to do our best to get through the whole thing. <clears throat> but since we're on the fourth session, only on page 12, <laughs> I'm like... It's turning almost like the DHT. We'll actually get into chapter 2 tomorrow. You know, so, but we're going to try to move along with this. So, but that whole, the, see, the thing is, if I come in and I told you every detail of every scripture, if you're not going to do anything with it, it wouldn't matter if I did do that. But if I come in and get you going and get you to reading this and seeing it, and then you go home and study it and you do something with it, then you will have learned more by us covering half the book and you doing something with it, then by us covering the whole book, and you just go, okay, that was neat, and what's next? We've got, as the church, we've got to get past the idea of what's next. What's next is not what's important. What's important is what's now, right? In this, what is here, what is now, what is in us. Uh, the church is just like the world, in that we're constantly looking for the next fad, the next new thing. We're waiting for somebody to come through and bless us and you know have some something you know a new anointing and there's always a new anointing floating around according to people we've got to move away from that and move into who Christ is in us and doing what he wants us to do here and now I have a some signs <clears throat> old looking signs that I bought at a roadside shop thing uh, just in North Texas there and it said one of them said you do what you can where you are with what you got and that's just kind of a good way to to, just to live, all right? And because you can, you can spend the rest of your life waiting to get something else to help you do something that's right in front of you. And you don't need to wait. You need to get busy. You, you put your hand to it, God blesses it, and it works, all right? There's no need for God to pour anything through you if you're just sitting there with your arms folded and not doing anything. If you want God to pour through, you got to give an outlet, all right? It's real simple. Now, we had just read, and these are, you need, these scriptures, you need to take them and meditate on them. I mean, seriously, don't just read them and, okay, what's the next one, what's the next one, okay, okay, let's go, let's go. No, take them, study them out, chew on them a bit, read them, read them out loud. And I have a standard way that I study that is pretty simple. I mean, a lot of times I'll just go through and I'll just, first time I'll read through the whole chapter or whatever it is, I'll read it. Then I'll go back through it, and when I'm reading it as a whole, I'm just trying to get the overall idea. And I usually know what it was written about or who it was written to and that kind of thing. But I'll try to go in and get the idea, the general idea. Then I'll go back and take it verse by verse and break it down word by word. And I'll start looking it up in the Greek or in the Hebrew, depending on what verse I'm looking at. And I'll start looking at it and saying, okay, this means that, and it was translated this way and this way, and sometimes it gives you a little more fuller understanding. But then I will always go back and I always end up reading it out loud to myself. And that way I'm actually hearing what they heard when it was read to them whenever they received the letter from Paul. And there's ways to read it. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Let me pick a short one here. Otherwise we'll be here a while. Uh, go down to the third one there. It's Romans 6.4. Actually, go to the next one, Romans 6, 7.6. 6. See it right in the middle, Romans 7.6 right there? He says, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, you can read that and you get an idea of what it says. But to get that in you, you can, you can do it. One of the ways I was originally taught how to study scripture was just to say it out loud and you just read it out loud and read it out loud and read it out loud. And that's, that's good. You'll get something from it. But then I started taking it and taking each word. For instance, I would start where it says, but now, and I would read it like this. I'd say, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And the next time I would read it, I'd say, but now. See how I'm putting emphasis on different words? But now we are delivered from the law etc etc then I would come back and say but now we are delivered from the law but now we are you hear every time you read it with a different emphasis on the word it doesn't change it but it digs it in deeper 
and you start to read it the way it was read to them and you will hit certain areas where it's like this is the way it was now you know that if you read it like I'm saying out of all of these so basically you say how many times would I have to do it like that well you count the words <laughs> and however many words there are you're gonna read it that many times and put an emphasis on each one now you know if you do that at some point you will hit the right emphasis right the exact emphasis that Paul wrote it so that's a good way to go through and study now one of the side benefits of that is you have read that verse by the end of that time if there's 20 words in there you have read it out loud to yourself 20 times without even realizing it right and it digs in you the neat thing is the next time you go to quote that verse and you will because it'll start coming out of you what you spend time in starts to come out of you and when you quote it the way you quote it I have a, a firm belief that when you quote it out by the Spirit like that that's the way it was written right because that's the way the Spirit brought it forth now so but now notice in the verse or go back up toward the top Colossians 3 verse 9 through 11 now later on we're going to go through the whole book kind of for each of these books Colossians Galatians Ephesians Philippians and we're going to look at those and we're not going to cover every verse in depth but we're all going to hit it because the reason I put so much scripture in is because I don't want you I want to make sure that we never just pull a verse out of context and the best way to make sure we don't is to include the whole thing now obviously we don't have time to go into in-depth studies of the in, of every word of every verse of every chapter of every book but we can go in and in the course of our study we're studying the new man this new creation what happens so the verses we will highlight and study and look at in depth will be the ones that have things in them words that say in Christ in him by whom by him uh, all, all of these you know different ways of saying it we will start emphasizing those now uh, one of the little books it's real good to have and it's almost the equivalent but it's really small it, and it gives a list of these scriptures is a book by uh, it was put out by Kenneth Hagin years ago called in him or in him scriptures or something I think it's just in him and it's good because you can have all the scriptures right there but they're not all written out there's a whole lot of them that are just a scripture the reason I put this this way is so that you can actually take the book with you the manual and you don't have to have the Bible with you as you go through this because you can just take that and read it because it's whole now I'm not telling you don't read it according to the Bible but it's going to say the same thing because it's all scripture Colossians 3 9 through 11 lie not to one, one to another seeing or in other words here's why you shouldn't lie to one another okay seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man now again every time he mentions the new creation the new man he gives us almost a definition or at least a description of this new man verse 10 and have put on the new man which the new man is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him and this is twice that we've heard this that the new man in you this the real you has been recreated after the image of God so your problem is not internal like that it's it's actually almost external in the sense that as I said before it's soulish so really what we're trying to get you to do is trying to get you to quit operating from a natural unrenewed mind we're trying to get you to focus on the spirit of who you are and that this book tells you who you are and as you do that you will renew the mind so then eventually you will be able to work straightforward without any thought of where you're operating from because the mind and the spirit will agree now the only way they're going to agree is if you get them renewed you get the, the mind renewed until the mind is renewed you're going to have struggles and you are going to be your biggest problem okay you're going to have this struggle back and forth and the mind renewal the renewed mind is just this book the Bible in context rightly divided rightly understood that's all it is because this book Jesus was this book personified he perfectly personified and exemplified every verse in this book now we are created in him now when we get back to Ephesians I don't want to look for it in here but when we get to Ephesians we're going to look at a verse I'll go ahead and read it to you and if you have your Bible you can look or you can just mark it because like I said it is in your manual it's just not we're just not there yet 
But in Ephesians, standard uh, verse that you'll hear me quote many times, in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 11, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints or maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. And he gave these fivefold ministry, verse 13 says, until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now the word knowledge there is epignosis. It means a complete, full, experiential understanding. Right? That does not mean until we all come to know that Jesus is the Son of God. If you're a Christian, you know that. You're not a Christian without knowing that Jesus is the Son of God. So he can't be talking about that knowledge. He's talking about the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to give us the knowledge that Jesus himself has. You understand that? So this, you're going to, if you're going to walk in the Word of God, you're going to reach a place where you're going to make a decision, you're going to have to, to make a decision to quit talking and thinking like a normal human. You are going to have to start thinking and talking like a son of God. And the only pure example of a son of God we have is Jesus. So you're going to start talking and acting like him. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says that now we have the mind of Christ. Well, you have that mind, but where is that mind? Well, it's the mind of the Spirit, and the mind of the Spirit is in the, is in the Spirit. So you already have the mind of Christ, and as you renew your mind to the Word of God, which the Word of God is the mind of Christ, as you renew your mind to the Word of God, then the mind of the Spirit can operate in conjunction with the soul that has now been submitted to the Spirit and renewed. Okay? This is the key. <clears throat> Without, and, and this whole... Our walk as Christians is a walk of the renewed mind. That, that's it, all right? Now, your spirit, and, and the thing is, any battles, any troubles, any hindrances, any, any, anything that you experience that does not line up with the Word of God is going to be experienced through your soul. And it's going to be because that's a part of your soul, your mind, that has not been renewed. Right? Because your renewed mind agrees with this word 100%. See? Your spirit is born again. When you got born again, you got born again because you made Jesus your Lord. So you accept the fact that Jesus died for you, bore your sins, and was resurrected and lives. Now, to the degree that you understand that, your mind is renewed in that section. Doesn't mean your whole mind is renewed, but that part is. So that's that part has been renewed. And it is renewed to agree with your spirit, which is in agreement with this word. Okay? Now, the more of your mind you renew, in other words, the more of this book that you start understanding, seeing, reading, walking out, and living, the more it renews your mind. And the more your mind is renewed, the freer, the more freedom the spirit has to work through you. So that once your mind is renewed, now, I do not believe and cannot find anything in Scripture that would lead us to believe that God expects that God would expect it expect us to take 30, 40, 50 years to renew our mind. The mind renewal process should be much faster because the Bible talks about us growing up and here's the, the key I was trying to get to here. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man so the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to grow us up, <clears throat> to perfect the saints, to edify the body, till we all come to the unity of the faith and to knowing what the Son of God knows experientially, not just knowing about it, and unto a perfect man, a mature man, now watch this, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The fivefold ministry's purpose is to grow us up until we are walking exactly like Jesus. Amen. Now the beauty of it is, it goes even further than that. Most people, if you were just walking through life, walking through anywhere you go, Walmart or anywhere else, and as people got around you, and you saw someone sick, you'd look at them and say, you know, be healed, and they were healed, and you ran out of food, and you were trying to feed somebody, and you said, well, 
here, you know, bring the food to me, bless it, hand it back, okay, it starts multiplying. If you had those things going on, most people would just stop right there and go, this is good enough. You know, this is pretty good right here. I'm doing what Jesus did. But Jesus said, that's not good enough. Jesus said, not only will you do the works that I do, but you'll do greater. Right? Now, we don't see a whole lot of greater, except we see Peter. And as he walked past, they would bring people out so that his shadow would fall on them. Now, there's no record of that with Jesus. That's a greater work. You see? I can give you all kinds of... There's no example. Paul did a greater work. He sent out cloths from his body. There's no record of that with Jesus. Now, Jesus would send the word, and that's a pretty good work too, even at a distance. But there, and people touched him, and he touched them. But with Paul, he would send out a cloth that he wore. And if they were sick, they got healed. If they had demons, they were delivered. Right? So the life, and as I always point out in the DHT, the fact that these claws, that if people went out, if, when these claws were sent out, if someone were sick, they got healed, or if they had a demon, they were delivered, that proves that there is not a special anointing for healing and a special anointing for deliverance. It proves that it was life in this cloth that whatever, whatever the person needed, when that cloth got near them that was literally impregnated with the very life of God, that the life of God took the form of their answer. It wasn't, okay, we're going to pray with this one for healing. There you go. This one for deliverance. There you go. Oh, wait a minute. You had the deliverance. Here, let y'all trade claws. Because, see, that's, but that's what we picture it. But see, until I bring this out and show it to you, you wouldn't think it. Until truth hits you, you don't know to throw out error. So we have to bring truth up to go, oh, here it is. And that's what these seminars are for. Now, here, we are to grow up into Jesus. In all things, it says. As a matter of fact, in uh, verse 15, yeah, well, 13 says, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, that we henceforth, from now on, be no more children tossed to and fro. So if you're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, we know that you're a child, right? When you quit being tossed around and you start being stabilized and established, the Bible says, then you're starting to grow up, right? And you be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now also, see that shows you that children can be easily deceived. Right? Because if somebody comes along with good words or something that sounds really spiritual, and honestly, the more spiritual it sounds, usually the less accurate it is. Right? Usually, G Jesus was naturally spiritual. He didn't try to be spiritual. He didn't walk around trying to force things. He just was who he was. A fish doesn't have to try to swim. You know, it just does what it is. It's the same thing with us. As Christians, we shouldn't have to try to emanate the Spirit. We shouldn't try to release the Spirit. We shouldn't have to. Now, I'm not saying that you don't at times have to focus on it to recognize it or become sensitive to it. Because you have to look at something to recognize it. What I'm saying... Sometimes we, we should be doing it and then recognize it, right? But we think we have to pull it out of God and make him do it. And that's not it at all. We just have to be. Jesus didn't say, now listen, make your light shine. He didn't say that. He said, let. You hear that? He didn't say, make it shine. He said, let it shine. Why? All you got to do to let it shine is open up, right? The way to hide it. Is hide it. If you got to make it shine, then you got to pour on the coals and get the fire stirred up and do all that kind of stuff, you know. And, now, and there is a truth to stirring up the gift that's in you. There is a truth to that. There is a truth to praying fervently. I'm not against that. But I'm saying there has to be an aspect where we are who we are. Usually the reason you have to stir something up is because you're working out of your soul and you think you have to stir up the spirit. The reality is if you'll operate out of your spirit, your soul is being renewed and you'll just be. Amen? That's what you want. We're talking about an effortless Christianity in the sense that when I say effortless, what I mean is, I'm not saying you want to have problems or any of that. I'm just saying it's effortless. We shouldn't have to try. Have you ever noticed in the Old Covenant, it said if you keep the laws, you keep the statutes, you do what you're supposed to do, and the, all these blessings will overtake you. In other words, you can't even outrun them. They're going to get to you no matter what. Isn't that what he said? That's under the old covenant. We're under a new covenant, a better covenant with better promises. And yet we have Christians now working harder to get blessed than the Jews did 
under the old covenant. This is a better covenant. I'm not saying you're not going to have struggles. I'm not going to say you're not going to have tribulations. You are. But I'm saying it shouldn't be hard to be what you are. The struggles and tribulations come from the outside on you because you're being who you are. I mean, most people don't ever get persecuted because most people, most Christian, most people can't even tell you're Christian. Right? So they wouldn't know to persecute you. Right? The Bible says all who live godly in Christ Jesus. Why ain't I getting persecuted? Maybe you're not living godly. That's what he said. Right? So there has, there has to be something to cause the enemy to take notice of you to come after you. That's what Paul said. Paul said, the reason, reason I got this you know, messenger of Satan coming after me is because I got a lot of revelations and I'm pouring these things out and he's trying to stop it. Right? But most people never cause enough stir in the spiritual realm to even wake up the devils around them to come after him. Amen? Yeah, I tell people all the time, you need to develop a reputation in hell. Amen? You need to let them know. You're the new sheriff in town. Amen? Now, but he says in verse 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, notice, and we could go on and on, and at some point we'll get back into this here. But it said that the whole purpose of the fivefold ministry and the whole progress of the Christian is that we are to grow up into Christ. Well, that's not supposed to happen. You know, you get saved when you're, you know, say you get saved when you're 12. And you're not supposed to finally grow up into Christ whenever you're 85. I mean, that's a whole lot of time that you're not being as effective for the kingdom as you could be. The idea is if you get saved at 12, we ought to get your mind renewed quickly and get you walking like Jesus. But if you don't believe you can do that, or if you believe you've got to wait for something, or you've got to believe it's you know, strictly at his will that he's going to move you around like some kind of robot, you're just going to waste a whole lot of time. And, and most of the people you'll come in contact with will never see Christ in you. But years ago, back as far as, I guess, 1979, 80, somewhere like that, I had a big poster board. My wife... I was always putting, I like dry erase boards. I still work on them a lot. I got them in my, my room in my, in my house. It's kind of a little office I put together. And I've always got these dry erase boards. I got maps up. But in the early days, I didn't have my own room. And so anything I did, and I didn't have dry erase boards. I had poster boards, right? And I would take these big magic markers, and I would write all these scriptures on them, and I'd write this stuff down. And on the back of our front door, I had this big poster board written in magic marker, you know, and my wife wasn't happy about that, about putting these things up all over the walls because it wasn't, you know, good. I don't know why it mattered. The house wasn't decent enough to put up good decorations in it. And anyway, I think our rent was $120 a month <clears throat> way back. And so, but on that poster, it said, you may be the only Christ some people ever see. Yes. And I had that. That was the last thing I saw before I left my house every day to remind me who I represented and how to treat people. Now, I didn't always live up to it. But I was heading that direction, okay? Now, he says in verse, uh, we were already here. Yeah. Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. So the renewal we're talking about is knowledge, right? One of the things in the charismatic, well, not so much charismatic, more Pentecostal lines, is that we were always against knowledge. We always said, oh, knowledge, that's out of the head. Nope, can't use that. Just, you know, totally disregard that. It's all by the Spirit. Okay, and because we did that, we never renewed our minds because we discounted the mind. We didn't like learning. We didn't like teaching. We didn't like any of that stuff. And so we got to where we never really studied the Word of God. We just expected the Spirit to move, and whatever happened, happened. But in reality, if I, I would challenge you, get a concordance, go in, and look up the word knowledge. There's several words. Knowing. Knowledge. Know. Those words. Look them up how many times they are in Paul's epistles. They are all through it. Over and over again. Look, the new birth, you had nothing to do with it, as I said before, except giving God permission to do it. But there is knowledge of the word of God that needs to be literally re-drilled correctly into your mind to renew your mind and so that your mind and your spirit can work together. Amen? Your problem is not your spirit. Your problem is not in the spirit. Your problems are in the soul. Every problem you encounter is due to one of two things. As I've often said before, it is in either you don't know 
what happened at the cross or you're not walking in what happened at the cross. Every problem you have, sickness, is because you don't know what happened at the cross. It's that simple. And what I mean by that is you're not walking in the benefit of it. Maybe you know it, but you're not walking in the benefit of it because by his stripes you were healed. So every problem goes back to that. But your problems, and, and if you focus in the wrong area, you're always going to end up with the wrong results. Your problems are not in the spirit. Your problems are in the soul. The devil can't, even though the devil is a spirit, he cannot work in your spirit if you're born again. You got it? Why? You say, well, the devil's in me. In you where? Well, I guess in my spirit. Well, okay, how can that be when old things are passed away and all things have become new and all things are of God? You see? So your problems, even if it is a devil, it's not going to be in your spirit. It's going to be in your soul or in your body. Sickness and disease is not in your spirit. Now, this is the problem in a lot of the teachings on healing because we try to go back and find where the root cause of the sin is because we think that if I'm sick in body, I have to be sick in spirit because that's been the teaching is that if, I, if my spirit, if there's sin or a, a sickness or a weakness in my spirit, then it will manifest in the physical body. That is not what the Bible says. Okay? Your problem is not in the spirit. Your spirit has been encapsulated, insulated by God if you're born again. Your soul is where the enemy works. Your soul is where the enemy works in you in sickness or disease, and then he works through that into your body. He looks for a weakness, either physically or mentally. And we have, as you may have heard me say before, we have several different immune systems. We have a spiritual immune system, a mental immune system, or emotional, and then we have a physical immune system. And of those, the spiritual is the most important. You keep the spirit strong, and usually the devil can't even attack in the other areas. Now, when I say keep the spirit strong, what I mean is you operate. Now, let me be very clear, because a lot of this terminology we just, even I, still throw around because I'm, I'm having to work out of the old terminology. When I say you stay strong in spirit, I don't mean doing something in the spirit. I'm saying, what I mean is you operate out of the spirit. That's being strong in the spirit. If you are strong in soul, it means you operate out of the, out of the soul. Okay? But if you, to be strong in spirit, you have to operate out of the spirit. Now, the Bible says that only the word of God is sharp enough to divide between spirit and soul. In other words, they both operate the same, they both look the same, and they are so intertwined that the only way you can tell, am I operating out of the soul or the spirit, is that you go to the word of God, and whatever the word of God says to do, if you're doing that, you're operating out of the spirit. If you're not doing what the Word of God says to do, then you're operating out of the soul. And only the Word of God can divide that and say, this is spirit, this is soul. Right? So to operate out of the spirit is very simple. Just do what the Word of God says. You want to say, okay, I, I go to the Walmart, there's a sick person, I lay hands on that sick person. Now, is that just me or is that out of the spirit? Okay, first off, you've asked two different questions. First off, that's not just you because you're not doing anything on your own anymore by yourself. It is as we say here in the South, that's y'all. Okay? That's you and Jesus. Well, yeah, but what I mean was, is that just me wanting to do that? No. Philippians 2.13 says, It is God who is in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. The very desire in you comes out of the Spirit of God that is in you that makes you want to do these things. That's one of the proofs that you're born again, is you desire to do the things of God. Now, see, an unsaved person could care less. You know, an unsaved person, this person with an unrenewed mind, would automatically think, there's a sick person. Oh, that's terrible. But at least I know I'm faster than them. I can get in the checkout line before they do. Right? That's the way unrenewed people think. That's the way unborn again people think. Born again people say, oh, you poor thing. Here, let me help you. What can I do to help you? Well, the Bible says lay hands on the sick. Let's do that. See, unsaved people don't even think that way. Right? They may think, okay, if, a, if an unsaved person is benevolent, they may think, let's pay for their doctor bill, let's pay for their medicine, let's give them a ride to the doctor's office, like that. But a saved person with the Spirit of God thinks, God, what can God do for them? Now, the problem has been, you know what God can do for them, you're just not sure God will work through you to get it done. So at some point, you have to not think about that, and you have to think, what would God do for them? Okay, that's what I'm going to do, because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, that we should imitate God, right, as dear children. And people say, yeah, but that was talking about love. Well, what do you think it is when you go to a sick person and lay hands on them? That's called love in action. 
That's what compassion is. It, n compassion isn't looking at them and going, oh, you poor thing. That's so pitiful. Yes. You know, here, uh, yeah, yeah, you're sick. Let me bring you chicken soup. That's not compassion. That's sympathy, yes. right? That is natural human. Divine compassion is, oh, you poor thing, let me help you out of the situation. Not let me make you comfortable in your situation. Let me help you out of it, right? That's compassion. That is following God in love. That's imitating Christ. That's imitating God. That's following God, right? Not just doing good. God, it's pretty amazing if you think about it. Jesus didn't come to make you good, right? He didn't come to make you nice. See, we, we've put all that in the gospel. Now, I'm not saying you ought to be mean. I'm not saying you ought to be rude. But I'm saying Jesus didn't have a real problem. What, what most people call rude, Jesus would call being truthful. Right? He just spoke the truth. Now, he spoke it in love. But you realize, I can speak it in love, but you might not hear it as love. You ever realize that? Because what determines whether it's love or not is my motivation in my heart, not how you hear. Because right? I guarantee you, Jesus spoke in love, even when he told the Pharisees, if you don't change, you're all going to go to hell. Right? I'm sure they didn't hear the love in Jesus' voice. Okay? I'm sure they were thinking, ah, that's not. But what they were hearing was arrogance. Who do you think you are? Okay? So love is based on the person giving it, not on the person receiving or not receiving it. Amen? And don't let other people determine your love. Okay? Well, I don't hear love in you. Well, then change your hearing. Okay? Isn't that what Jesus said? Jesus never said, listen, if you don't like what I'm saying, tell me so I can change it. He didn't say that. He said, listen, to him that has ears to hear. And that right? You know what that means? Listen, if you receive my message, you've got ears to hear. If you don't, that's you, not me, because I'm putting out the truth. Amen? Now, here he says, <clears throat> which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So what's in you looks like Jesus, looks like God. Amen? Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor un uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. You hear that? Now notice, no Greek or Jew. Well, that knocks out a whole lot of wrong teaching in the church right there. <laughs> circumcision nor uncircumcision. In other words, God's not paying attention to any of that anymore. What counts now is, are you a new creature? That's what he says right here. But Christ is all and in all. That's what counts. In Romans 6, 4. <clears throat> And you'll notice if you have a manual, you'll notice many of these are underlined, certain parts of them, and some of them are bold letters. That's what I want you to focus on. And hopefully when you get done with this seminar, you're not going to go put this book on a shelf somewhere and just let it go there and go, okay, uh, you know, what's next? Hopefully you'll take this, go through, underline, and say, why did he underline that? Well, read it and find out. It's not for me to tell you. It's for you to go in and dig out. Okay? <clears throat> he says, therefore, Romans 6, 4, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, what does that tell you? I want this to be more interactive. I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to get you necessarily answering all the questions and stuff, but think about this. What does it mean to walk in newness of life? Shouldn't that mean that your life is different than it used to be? And yet, isn't that the biggest question we hear? Isn't that the biggest debate we hear about the Christian life is, you know, how do I get change to happen? Why, why, how, how come I've been struggling with this for so long, right? I can tell you very simply, your struggle is the result of your refusal to lay down your life. That's it, right? If you're struggling between sin and this thing, you know, and between God in the world, if you're struggling with past sins and addictions and problems, the struggle is not the devil has a hold of you. The problem is you have a hold of the devil. Yes. Right? Is that pretty easy? At some point, it's funny because God never put any blame on the devil in the sense of, oh, you know, stop being a devil and leave them alone. He always said, no, you awake to righteousness. No, you resist the devil. He didn't say, oh, don't worry about that. The devil's going to leave you after a certain time. No, you resist. It's always on you. The struggle is you, right? Because you don't want to quit what you like. That's why he says, if any man is tempted, 
when, he's, when, he, when he is tempted, he is drawn away of his own lust. didn't say he's drawn away because the devil comes in and just sweeps you out. He says, whatever you're being tempted with, you like it. See, I, I've, I always have to give the whole, not the whole story, but at least enough of it. I've never tasted alcohol. My dad drank when I was uh, very young, and I saw the effects of it. And I've hated alcohol since that day. I've never tried alcohol. I don't want to try it. don't want anything to do with it. I hate it, right? Now, so I can honestly tell you, I have never been tempted to drink. I mean, it's not even temptation. When I was about nine years old, I made a decision. Don't want nothing to do with that. And I'm telling you, I used to hang out in the nightclubs. I, hang, I used to hang out in bars. I taught martial arts. I did security for bars. I did all, you know, all kinds of stuff in bars. But I, all I ever drank there was Coke or water. That was it. People would buy me drinks, bring them to me, and I'm saying, nah, sorry, you know, you, you want to buy me something, get me a Coke. I'll drink a Coke. There, was, there wasn't even a temptation, right? But that's because at a young age, I decided I hate that. There was no temptation. The reason you have problems is because you don't hate it. Yes. When you hate it, it's no longer a problem. So whatever, and if you're going to be drawn away, you're drawn away of your own lust. Those are the things you like. Now, to be clear, there were a lot of other things that I didn't hate. Right? There were other things I didn't make those vows for. I didn't say I would never touch them. And all the other sins I did. It was just alcohol and drugs and, and cigarettes. That was the only things that I really didn't do. So, but I wish I'd made a whole lot more vows in all these other areas. You know, I wish I'd learned to hate all these other things, but I didn't. But even now I hear people act like it's such a struggle. And I tell them, the struggle is you still like this. You have to hate it. And the, pro the reason you like it is because you don't see it as bondage. You don't see it as the wages of sin is death. You don't see that. You don't see this as bondage, and you don't see it as death. And until you see it as bondage and death, you won't hate it. Right now, you see it as some type of pleasure in some form. So first thing you have to do is re recognize it for what it is. It's a trap. And when you start thinking kingdom, and you start thinking in terms of the fact that you're an ambassador for the kingdom of God, then you have to realize, if you went to work for the State Department, or even for the FBI, or something like that, before, you, for, before they hire you, they will do intensive background checks. Why? They, do they just want to know everything about you just so they have it in their files? No, they're looking for reasons to not accept you. And the reasons they wouldn't accept you is, they want to know, does he have a gambling habit? Does he have a drinking habit? You know, does he have a womanizing habit? Because if you have those things, then an enemy could trap you, blackmail you, and use you because you don't want those things exposed. So they will look for the things that you have an affinity for. They'll look for things that you like. And they will try to trap you. Now, do you really think the enemy, an enemy of the state, really cares about your pleasure? Do you really think they want, they, let's see how we can make this guy rich through gambling. Let's, let's set the table so he can be rich. No, they're looking for ways to trap you. They don't want you to be happy. They don't want you to gain pleasure. They want to trap you so that when it comes time, they can tell you, keep your mouth shut. Don't tell on this person. Don't do that. Do what we tell you. Why? Because we got this to hold over your head. If you ever start thinking kingdom and recognizing you're an ambassador, you'll recognize that's what sin is. It, the devil could care less about you. You don't mean nothing to him other than the fact that you are a threat. And he wants to find a way to trap you so that he can blackmail you, so he can hold it over your head and extort you, so that you will, when it comes time to talk against this thing, he can go, ah, you don't want to bring that up, because if you talk against that, I'll expose you here. And you'll go, oh, yeah. And, and you'll start backing out. I used to have a saying, I said, that if... A sin that you'll defend is usually the sin you're in. And so if there is sin going on, you're, well, you know, that's not that big a deal. It's usually because you're involved in it. And so at some point, you have to learn it's not about God not wanting you to have some form of pleasure, but you have to realize that what you take is pleasure right now. The Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season. That there is, that pleasure you have for right now is actually a bondage and a trap so that later the devil can use it against you. Right? Once you see it as that, I taught my kids, <clears throat> even growing up, because I was very, uh, because of the martial arts and stuff, I was very security minded. And I, I taught my kids, 
you know, look around you. As a, as a child myself, we had times when the police would come take me out of school because my dad worked narcotics, undercover narcotics officer. And <clears throat> there'd be somebody to make a threat against his life and against our family. And they would come pick me up at school and take me to another place. And I'd meet my mom there and that kind of, and we would live there for two weeks or something. That kind of stuff went on. And so <clears throat> I, I learned, and, and I even knew, my dad taught me from early on. We lived about uh, six, eight blocks from the school. He said, don't ever walk the same way home every day. You don't do that. You walk different ways. Because if somebody sees it, they'll watch you and then they'll wait for you. And he taught me to be <laughs> paranoid, some people would say. It's, <laughs> it's really not paranoid, but <laughs> I still don't like sitting with my back to a door. <laughs> we go somewhere to eat, I sit with my back to a wall. It's just habit now. I don't have to think about it, but used to it was to keep from getting hit in the back of the head with something. That's the bar days, okay? Anyway, so, <laughs> but we have to, I taught my kids to think security-minded in the sense of it's as if the enemy is waiting out there to get you into a pattern or to get you into something to trap you. The enemy doesn't care. He's not going to bring you what you like because he cares about your pleasure. The enemy is going to try to trap you and use it against you. Now, as a, as a new creation, your struggle is in the soul, but it, your struggle is because you still like those things. So that would be the first thing. Now, in the church, we have gotten away from the teaching of what the Bible calls sanctification, and there's degrees of it, and there's instantaneous sanctification, obviously, but there is a progressive aspect of sanctification. Now, I do not have time to get into it right now, but it is something that the church has lost for, for, to a large degree, and it's one of the reasons why there is so much rampant sin in the church, because they're just not taught what it means to be sanctified, all right? which is where the word saint came from. right? And I always tell everybody, you, you're either a saint or you ain't. right? We need to realize you're either in the kingdom or you're not. You're either living for God or you're not. You are serving God or you're serving the devil. There is no, there's no neutral. We've got to realize this. There is no neutral ground. If there was such a thing as a neutral ground, then there would have been such a thing as no need for Jesus. Right? If there's a neutral ground, I could just live there. I'm not for God. I'm not for the devil. Just leave me alone both sides. You know, just let me go. But it's not that way. You're in one family or the other. And you may claim one family, but people can see by your life that you live for another family, right? So at some point, the church just, and I'm not talking about being legalistic and all that, but at some point, I'm talking about you being individually looking at your life and going, you know what? I ought to live what I believe. I ought to live what I say I believe. I ought to live right. I ought to live this way. Now, you say, well, I've tried that before and it didn't work. Nope. You've struggled. You liked what you were doing. Usually, most people, it's not that they hate sin, it's that they don't want to go to hell. And so they try to live good enough. They don't really live good enough for heaven, so to speak. They just don't live bad enough for hell. They want that neutral area, and there is no neutral, right? So it's either or. Just live right. Be who you are. All these things that, you, the, the way you've possibly been living, or the way that, the, the actions and things where there is a struggle, that's not you. If you're born again, that ain't you. That's why there's a struggle. Unborn again, people don't have a struggle. They live for themselves. They, we can't even say technically they live for the devil. Some would, but mostly they live for themselves. So it's, they don't have any struggle about doing right. They just live however they want to live. The struggle is in you, and it's because you're trying to hang on to the world and hang on to the things rather than die to those things and live for God. The Bible says we should no longer live unto ourselves, but live unto God. Amen? Now, we were talking about some of this last night, I mean, some of the guys, and I, another sign that I have at home that says, find something worth dying for and live for it. I've been around the church for a while. I've seen a lot of things that come through the church. I've seen different groups and camps and teachings and all this stuff. And I can tell you, I was in those groups. And honestly, until I got a hold of this in, in its entirety, or, or at least you know, I, what I understand this, I've never seen a gospel that was worth dying for, especially the way I've heard it taught in the church. You know? And I've, one of the things that stood out to me was that you read the gospels. Jesus just walked along past people. And like he did with Matthew, he just walked past him and basically says, come follow me. 
Now, I don't think that was the first time Matthew ever saw him. Because Jesus had been out, had been preaching, had been around a bit. And then he waited a while before he started calling his, his 12 disciples. He, he didn't gather them right at the beginning. But it's amazing because whatever Jesus was preaching, it was enough to make grown men in business get up and walk away from their business. Get up and just shut down their shop and go, you know what? It, it made fishermen who are businessmen, but fishermen love to fish. They love it, isn't that right? And he, he preached a gospel that made, biz, made these fishermen say, you know what? I will walk away from my boat. I will walk away from my net. Do you realize what kind of gospel a fisherman would have to hear to do that? I mean, I'm not, you know, building them up like they're something, but I'm just saying, just the fact that somebody would walk away from that, from their business, their family, their, their livelihood, everything, and say, I've got to follow you. Why? I, I don't know. You know, I don't know what it is. You're calling me to this. You're, you're saying I'm going to die. They're going to cast me out of the synagogue, and people are going to do bad things to me and say, think they're doing a service to God, and psst, here I am. Now, honestly, with the gospel or the message that you've heard in the church today, have you heard anything that would make a man live like that? Because I haven't. And, I, and like I said, I've been around a while. Now people say, well, well, just the gospel of Jesus, you know, that he gave his life and died for us. Okay, okay, I agree that should be enough. But I, obviously it's not because it doesn't happen. And honestly, a lot of it is the fact that we have changed the gospel now to where it has come to the point where, oh, no, God wants you to stay where you are. Don't do anything else. Don't change. And he wants to make you rich where you are. And that's it. And that is his will rather than his will is the evangelization of the world. It is the Great Commission. That is his will. If you go back and study the early Pentecostals, that's what they understood. When they got born again and they got baptized in the Spirit, it's funny, when they got baptized in the Spirit, first thing they did when they spoke in tongues was they would try to say, well, what language is this? Did, does anybody recognize what language I'm speaking? And they say, you know, that sounds, that sounds kind of like Chinese. All right, well, I guess we're going to China then as missionaries. And they would pack up and move. No mission board, no backing, no finances, nothing. They used to call them the missionaries of the one-way ticket. That's what they did. That's what effect that gospel had. And the early Pentecostal message was that way. Now think about that. Nowadays we say, okay, uh, how many of you are born again? How many of you, is there anybody here that hadn't received the Spirit? Oh, okay, come down front, receive the Spirit. There you go, okay, live your life like it's nothing. And yet the early Pentecostals, early Christians even back you know, A.D. 30 through 60, 90, about up to 150, all the way up to 300, actually. But in the early 1900s, these people quit their jobs. They would pack up and move just because they spoke in tongues. They're like, all of a sudden, they got on fire for God. And they would start going out and preaching the gospel and going to cities. And that's why even now, you know, almost every town you go to, I don't care how small it is, you'll find an Assembly of God church there. Why? Because that's what they eventually you know, broke into and started calling them. Originally, they were called apostolic faith. And then they started calling themselves full gospel or, and then Pentecostal and all these different terms. But you can go anywhere because they would go there and say, is there, is there a church here? Well, what, what do you mean? We got this one. Is there one here that speaks in tongues? Oh, no. Okay, well, you've got to plant one. That's the way they thought. That's what the baptism in the Spirit did to them. And yet today it's just an add-on. Oh, well, we want you to experience the full, everything God's got for you. So we want you to get healed, born again, Baptized in the Spirit. If you got those, if not, come down front. We'll give it to you like we're just passing it out. It causes a life change. We're talking about a new person living in you that whose sole purpose is to change this world. That's what he lives for. And then you, he, you get him in you, and you wonder why there's a struggle in you. I mean, that's part of it right there. Is you got the Spirit of God want to go one way, and you're like, <laughs> I like comfort. And that's why we have these false gospels that says everything is based on comfort. Everything is about you. And the fastest way you can tell if it's not the true gospel is, it'll be self-focused. If it goes back to you and your benefit and only your benefit, bless us, Lord, us for no more kind of thing, if that's you, guess what? It's not the gospel. The gospel is just like the military. You get in. Once you get in, it's about everybody else but you. Now you don't count anymore, right? Now, once you get in, though, we've got to get you well because a healthy soldier is better than a sick soldier, Right? So we got to get you well. But it's not about you being well because you're being well. It's about you being well so you can be more effective as a soldier, as a worker for Christ. Amen? Some point, and this is where we get down to it, 
you have to learn to die. Now the reason I'm emphasizing all this is because it does me no good to tell you what life in Christ is like if you've never really died. And it'll be really frustrating trying to live a resurrection life without having died first. Right? You can't live resurrection without dying. There has to be a death before there can be a resurrection. We try to jump over that part. Jesus didn't come to save you in your sins. He came to save you from your sins, which means you have to die and come into Him. Amen? Amen. Now, this is honestly about as pure a gospel as you can get. Now, we're going to get more into this as we go along. I'll get you in some of these other scriptures. We're going to start hitting some of them going straight through. But I'm going to read this last one. I think it's the last one. Yep, on, on this page. <clears throat> now, he said uh, two of them. Yeah. Well, Romans 6, 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And then in one chapter later, he says, But now are we delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit. Now this is almost the same terminology. And not in the oldness of the letter. Now finally, another verse that's vital, as it says here, is 1 John 4, 17. You're going to hear this a lot. I'm going to keep repeating it over and over again. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Now stop right there. In the day of judgment. You know what that tells you? That ain't this day. You get that? This is not the day of judgment. Amen? Amen. It says that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because... Here's why we're going to have boldness. As he is, so are we in this world. Now that one verse, if you would take that one verse and just meditate on that, read it out loud, chew on it, go over and over, look it up, take it apart, put it back together, just dwell on it. You could spend years on that verse. Literally, not trying to get something new out of every day, but just trying to get a hold of it to where you realize this verse sums it all up. As he is, not as he was, as he is. So are we. Not so are we going to be. So are we now in this world. Not on the other side. Here. Now. Amen? You get that? We are seated with him in heavenly places. It's really amazing. He's there. We're here. But we're there with him and he's there with us. Right? So there is this absolute union between us and however he is, so are we. Now. So that's why our love is made perfect. That's why we have boldness in the day of judgment. Because we can say, you know what? Uh, go ahead, examine me. Why? Because as he is, so am I. That's how we are, right? So I, I don't fear judgment. Why? Because judgment, I, I pass from judgment. You understand? But this is not the day of judgment. The judgment day is coming. But this ain't that. Well, when that happened, that was a judgment of God. You know, them, them hurricanes there or them tornadoes that tore up Alabama and tore up you know, Joplin, well, that was a judgment of God. No, it wasn't. No, it was not. That was not the judgment of God. And you say, well, whose fault was it? Christians. For not standing out there and going, no, you don't. You do not come here. You do not touch this area. Yes. That was what Christians, the, the, the church is responsible yes. for their city yes. and should be taking hold of it. I, I've heard so many stories and testimonies. Some of our DHTs, there was a, um, they sent me a video clip. They were in Joplin this thing hit or was coming in and they were in a store and they videotaped it and when they came in first the power went out but they still had their cell phone that they recorded it with and they went back into a, uh, a room like a cooler like thing and this thing hit and they kept it recording the whole time it lasted about three five minutes something like that and they're recording the whole thing you can hear them they're praying commanding and just it's funny because you could hear some of them they weren't all of the same belief. Okay? <laughs> Some were praying, you know, oh Lord Jesus help us, oh help, oh God please help, oh please don't let it happen, you know, all this kind of stuff. And you can hear our DHT's in the background saying, in the name of Jesus, right now we command this to die. We command this to die. We command uh, no death, no loss of life, doing all that stuff. When they walked out, the whole building was gone and where they were at was the only thing that was left. Amen? And not one of them were touched. And the, the kids come out of there, everybody come out of there. And it, it was amazing because it was by the name of Jesus. I mean, this is where we were meant to walk. So, take a break. We'll come back in a few minutes.